Good evening and welcome to Slam the Gavel, the show that tells it all regarding family court, other court issues, as well as CPS. I am your host, Marianne Petrie. Uh, I have a return guest. I have attorney Connie Regali back on. The last time she was on, and I've had her on my show several times, I've had her on season two, episode 98, season three, episode 63, 70, and 89. The last time she was on my show was August 5th. 15th. And we had talked about the new indictment of aggravated perjury and other malfeasance. However, since then, Connie has been taking a trip to DC. And then she also took a trip to Europe. And I'll let her explain that. But how was your trip to DC? Oh, thank you. And it's good to talk to you again. Um, yes. So the last time we were talking, I was really focusing on this ongoing retaliation that I've had to face with the judicial system in Tennessee. They are so, um, you know, and it's really odd to me that they're so intimidated and threatened by my voice because it's not like I have a million followers anywhere, but they have constantly, ever since I've started speaking out, and I really started speaking out as early as 2010 before we were even using a social media platform, but there's been just like this constant step through of aggression against me. And I know through you and some other podcasts, I've talked about how they criminalized me back in April when I was trying to run for judge and the only way they could do it was for the judge to actually change the law to 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 make a felony that was not a felony so that case is all in the process of appeal right now so however you know i tell people I, as they meet me on the street i says i'm probably the only felon you know that's walking around i'm not on probation i'm not on bond i'm not in jail it's like it was like all a big show i mean i was in the door walked in the door and walk out of the door and nothing was different except one huge thing and that was to discredit me mm -hmm. because they want to discredit my voice and so they put it all over the local publications, all over our local uh, websites, Williamson Herald, uh, you know, Williamson families, whatever they could. They they criticized people for listening to me. They did everything they could to discredit me because that's the only thing they can do to stop that voice. So mm -hmm. then after that, we went through the aggravated perjury. The new charges come up. I'm also fighting that. Um, I'm kind of asking the court to hold on that until I can get through some appeals because there's some issues there with materiality, which the district attorney has not addressed. So in the meantime, though, I'm an activist and mm -hmm. I'm a reformer and I'm a warrior and I'm a voice and I know the stuff I'm talking about, which is really about family court and child welfare reform. And I am not going to stop sharing that information. Mm -hmm. So what um, we did in September is I have a, a group that we've just organized informally through Facebook. Our Facebook organization is Family Forward Project. It has about 18,000 members, and it is primarily about families all over the country, and some of them either in other parts of the world who have been affected by the family court system, primarily child welfare system, the whole government intrusion into uh, their lives, taking their children, also, we, we use that forum to share news stories. You know, we're always posting news stories that are now beginning to pop up everywhere. And those news stories are about these state commissioners getting fired, mm -hmm. about Missouri losing a thousand children, about mm -hmm. the buildings that holding the records burning to the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are crazy stories. And so this is kind of a central platform for us to share that information. And then... We have statewide, we've developed smaller kind of sub organizations. If I can get somebody to kind of take on a lead in a state like I have in Missouri and, and in Illinois and Connecticut, then they sort of develop kind of a subgroup so that we can get more local information that we share. So what we did in September, I started working on it a couple months in advance and we organized a meetup and a congressional 
um, introduction. Uh, so I have a nonprofit, the Family Forward Foundation, which is at familyforwardfoundation.com. And I had raised a little bit of money. And so we use that money to get an Airbnb that would sleep 14 people. Mm -hmm. And then we invited, I invited people from all over the country who were activists. They had to pay their way to get there. They had to fly in. But then we had the housing paid for. And then we had Connecticut, a nonprofit, had raised some money for food. And so they bought a lot of the food so that we could cook there and really reduce the expenses as much as possible. And so it was an awesome experience. It was kind of a giant girl slumber party. Actually, we had so much fun. <laughs> but Aww. the important part of it was these were everyday people. These were moms and people who have either written about the child welfare system or watch the child welfare system or have their children taken. These were everyday people. And the whole point of this trip was to train people on how to, how to lobby, how to be a citizen activist. And this is really my call out to people mm -hmm. right now, right here. You can do this. And so many people feel so intimidated or so threatened. But this was the this was the the uh, the forum to do that. We're also very, very lucky because we have somebody we worked with for years that I met out of Arizona, Marissa Hamilton, who's now working with Freedom Works. And so while we were up there, we actually got to go and sit down and have a meeting with Freedom Works. And then we had another, a smaller group that went and met with the Casey Foundation. And so just to help get us additional support and mm -hmm. to be legitimized. And so we uh, were also very lucky in that now, finally, the congressional and Senate office buildings are starting to open back up. They have been totally closed down for over two years. And on this trip, we were allowed to get inside if we had an appointment. So we were lucky because we could make in one appointment. And then once we got inside, all these buildings are connected. So we could go through the tunnels and the basements and we could go to and stop by another office. So we had little smaller subgroups. We had like three or four smaller subgroups of just three or four people. You would have somebody like myself, who's kind of a veteran, and then you would have some um, other newer people who would join us. So mm -hmm. it was quite an experience. Did you get to talk to a lot of people? Did you felt they listened? I'm sorry. Did you did you get to talk to a lot of people that you felt that they listened to you? Uh, so of course, when you go there, you don't yeah. really, and Congress was just reopening. So you don't really get to talk to con uh, a Congress person. However, most of the time we were talking to their top aide and their mm -hmm. top legal advisor. And so these were people who actually their eyes were, would get like really huge when we would tell them about some of the funding problems and some of the things that were going on. What we were also able to find out while we were there is that CAPTA, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, is up for reauthorization. And that is the huge act that caused all the federal funding to start being driven to the states for the foster care program. So we pulled off the CAPTA acts. We found out what committee it was in. And this is this is quite interesting. And I really contribute this to just some of our grassroots efforts of getting out there is the CAPTA Act has been totally stricken and totally rewritten. And the important thing is that some of the rewriting now includes things for family advocacy and to reduce the removals. So this is such an important change. And, you know, I know they wanted to try to vote on this and get it out of committee before the end of the year. But as everybody knows by now, there's going to be a huge congressional shift that's going to happen. And so it's kind of a lame Congress right now. And, you know, although this is really a bipartisan bill, most of that cap CAPTA language was being driven by the Democrat members of the House uh, Welfare Committee. And so there'll be this huge shift. And this is why it's also going to be very important that I continue to have people who are willing to just step up and make some phone calls. 
we will probably be planning a whole nother trip in maybe February or March. And so this would be a great opportunity for people who are like, I just want to tag along. I just want to watch what's going on. I want to be able to have these conversations with my congressman in, in my own home state or with my state legislators. So CAPTA is up for reauthorization. And we also told them it was really time for a federal family advocate bill. And that's the one thing that we're just gonna keep pushing for, keep pushing for, keep pushing for. We've Some of the states are using family advocates, some of the states are not. Tennessee is not using it. And uh, yet they are continuing to be drowned with, pro drowned literally with problems. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. You you know, went down there and, you know, then then you turned around and went down to Florida. So you've been like super busy. Yeah. Yeah. So and actually after um, after the Washington, D.C. trip, I came back and I had been contacted by one of my followers on Facebook who was doing an international seminar in Switzerland. And I, you know, as now my schedule is so crazy and I'm not having to be in court all the time. I reached out to her and I said, I would actually like to come and be. And of course, she had invited me to be one of the speakers. And so I flew to Switzerland. And when I got to Switzerland, to beautiful Lugano, Switzerland, we had a small forum where we did some international seminar, but we also did it um, virtually. So we were able to broadcast it and she is continu continuing. She was translating it. She had translators available. And so I met a uh, attorney from Norway. His name is Marius and I can't even pronounce his last name, so I'm not gonna try. <laughs> but he is an incredible attorney out of Norway who has been watching the social welfare system in Norway, who is horrible at removing children. He has actually taken the country of Norway to the European court 17 times. And the mm -hmm. European court has held that he, uh, they have violated, Norway has violated human rights by taking children. And yet in some of those cases, even after he gets that opinion from the European court, they will not give the children back. So it's almost an exercise of futility. It has gotten so crazy. But the good news is we have all of those opinions are published. So when I was talking to Morius and he and I are having a conversation after the seminar, and he's telling me about an attorney in Zurich who is a big human rights activist attorney in Zurich. And so I'm like, while we're here, let's go see him. And so we were so lucky. We emailed him and we're able to get an appointment on Tuesday to be able to go to his office in Zurich and have a sit down conversation with him about what's happening with the child welfare system. And he was extremely supportive and wants to be able to do some things that he can help as well. So then we, I came back home and then I, um, there's also a Nordic Committee on Human Rights that has to do with child welfare. And I was able to turn around and go back to Sweden and participate in the Nordic Committee. So if people, you know, would just kind of like to see how that, what happened, how that went down, I have posted my speech on the, uh, at the Nordic committee on my YouTube channel, which is just Connie regularly, very easy to find. And I stood up and I talked to them. Now we had people there with multiple languages. So we had Swedish, we had Norwegian, we had Switzerland, which she's that she's in the Southern part. So it's Italian and English. So it was a bit of a challenge for some of us because there were a few people that did not speak English, but it was incredible. And also for people who've been in child welfare a long time, this is the place, this is a forum where Nancy Schaefer went to speak and talk about the international tragedy of human rights and child welfare in 2010. And then she was murdered a year later in 2011. And I was really glad to be part of that because this will probably be the last year that they have the Nordic Committee. So there will never be another Nordic Committee after this year. Well, so uh, Ruby Klassen Howard, I believe is her last name. I apologize in advance if I've messed that up, but she is the one who's been who's been in charge of the Nordic Committee for years. Like 1996 was when she started it, and she is now 75, and she's been an, an incredible warrior for families. She's helped a lot of children get out of the system, but the system has gotten so bad, and she's you know just really gotten so worn out. And to find somebody else to take over those reins is quite a challenge because you. This is not for just anybody 
anybody. This is for somebody who really has a passion, who really sees the problem that's going on and really wants to stand up to it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we hope there's somebody in the region or there's somebody in Europe. If we could sort of transform it into a European committee on this issue, that would be good because, you know, it's it's pretty easy to get around in Europe, right? I mean, you have trains and, you know, the, the flights are not that, ma- not, not that bad to jump from one company country to the next. So, you know, we hope that we can find somebody who will take this on because we need to continue to have an international discussion about this. I agree. And it can't stop. They yeah. have, we've got to, keep this going. This is so important. It is important. So after I returned from Sweden and I got settled here now, also you have to keep in mind my environment here. They've created a lot of chaos for me, which means that I'm always having to respond to some chaos that's been created, but I put some things, got some things in order. And then I made a trip to Florida, went down to Tampa, Florida, and we had uh, an event there and we had, oh, I don't know, maybe 30, 35 people from across the state who were able to come. But again, we uh, broadcast it. We did some lives, we uh, put it out there, and I know there's well over a thousand people who have watched that already. And we brought families up who have been affected. So when we have a state event, we like for there to be some families who can step up and who can talk about what happened to them in that process. Uh, That's important for them to hear exactly from those parents. Uh, the experiences until it happens to you, no one really understands any of this. Well, until it happens and, you know, I can get up all day and I can talk to you about the, um, the, the issue with the funding, right? Because the funding is perverted. The funding is rewarding states for removing children. And then the states don't get the money, the per diem per child, if they leave a child in a home. And a child who's put in the custody of the government can be easily up to worth up to $100,000 a year, just depending on how they categorize them, how they label them, what kind of special services they decide they need, whether or not they reclassify them, how many homes they pass them around to, how many therapists they send them to. So each child that goes into the system is a cash cow up to a hundred grand a year. Now, just think about it. Honestly, if you had a hundred thousand dollars to raise a child extra a year as a parent, I mean, (laughs) that would pay your rent. You could have like all kinds of therapists, right? You wouldn't even have to work. You could just raise your child on that money. But nope, not when the government does it. So, and then they turn around and of course order the parents to pay child support and sometimes even pay for those medical expenses if they have private insurance, even though the parents rarely have any say in that. So a child going into custody is very valuable. And when I say valuable, if you look at the expense and income column, so which you always have to look at, anybody who's got a business mind has to look at money in, money out, right? I mean, mm-hmm. when, when I say that, where is that money coming from? Well, that money is coming from the Social Security Fund. So the money is going into what we pay, the hard-earned taxpayers of America, what they are paying out of their pockets, out of their paychecks, going into the Social Security Fund that is then being used for wrongfully removing children. And these budgets have gotten so out of hand. So the states, every state on their state budgets for child welfare, because of the federal funding, about 35 to 40 percent of their budget is coming from the federal government. Again, I say government, government, government. Everybody just needs to put in their ear when I say government is your money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, The only way they have money is either print it and make totally fake money or to get the money from us. So when I say they get the money from the government, they get the money from your social security money, And then the state has the money that they get from however they're getting it, your sales tax money, your property tax money, however they're getting those funds. And so they have to keep feeding kids through the system. Now, Tennessee, I'm in Tennessee. I think most people who see me at all know that by now. But if they haven't, if they don't, and again, they can check out some things on my YouTube channel. 
they will know that I'm from Tennessee. So in Tennessee, I am on DCS all the time, which is another reason they had to discredit me and quiet me because this past year I went in and asked for a bill that would put a family advocate in every case. Now, the new CAPTA uh, legislation is also recommending family advocate programs be put in place by the states to help manage this family reunification process because of the conflicts of interest. So I asked for a family advocate bill in the state of Tennessee and DCS came in and lobbied against me. DCS went in to the legislators and discredited me, even though I went in and sat down and talked to every single member of the committee that the bill would have to go through. So they discredit me and they get rid of me. Now, what would a family advocate have done for this system? The purpose of the family advocate is to help people who are going through the system understand some of the policies and procedures, understand some of the things that they need to do to prepare for the process, to understand how they prepare themselves as a witness or how they get other witnesses on board to help them with the process. So a family advocate is not a lawyer, they're not a case manager, they're not a foster care manager, they're really somebody just to help a family have a better understanding of this, you know, and honestly, <clears throat> I think that they should have family advocates, even in the family court process, because there is so much going on, and so everybody has their hand in the pocket, right? The attorneys on both sides have their hands in the pockets to keep the adversity going, right? The judges, I mean, a third to one third to uh, 35 to 40 percent of the cases that go through the courthouses now are family cases. And the reason they love these cases is because they can keep them in court for 10 years, right? <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. they just keep them going, keep them going, keep them going. So there is such a system here. There is such systemic abuse because of all the conflicts of interest. And all that does is wear on the people who are in the process. It wears on the parents. It wears on the children. There are parents who lose their jobs because they have to go to court multiple times. It wears on the economics of that family. There are families who have spent their entire savings or their entire retirement account trying to defend child custody city cases. So, you know, we need a way to manage the system better so that it, it, it gets better results because obviously it's a failure. So we asked for the family advocate. It was booted out. It was kicked out. And yet what did they just do? So two days ago they in Tennessee, they just had a big pre press conference where the new commissioner of DCS comes in and asks the, the Tennessee taxpayers and again, it's not the government, it's us. They mm -hmm. ask the Tennessee taxpayers to pay another $150 million on an emergency basis now. This is not that they do not want to wait for the budget process, which would delay it another eight months because it would not be effective until July. They want right now emergency funding for the Department of Children's Services. They will not acknowledge the real problems that they have. And this is the frustration. Because it's just failing all the time. Every time you turn around, there's another child dead in foster care that was probably taken away from good, fit, healthy parents that were providing beautifully for this child. But the child maybe happened to have blue eyes and yeah. blonde hair and yeah, and adoptable. Yeah. It, yeah. So, you know, the whole adoption, I didn't even touch on to the, the funding related to adoption. And that's, that's another whole huge thing in and of itself, because the states actually get uh, bonus money, incentive money <clears throat> for adopting children out. And, you know, so they want these children to stay in foster care for as long as they can. And then they want to adopt the children out to strangers. And, oh, excuse me. And, and Connie, by that time, when the child has been ripped away from their parent, and that has caused horrible trauma, then they're put into foster care where God knows what happens to them in there, <clears throat> including rape and other things. And then adopt them out to some nice couple, we hope. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, and you know, people don't understand that there is nothing special about a foster parent. I mean, a foster parent, all you have to have is a high school education. They're not child psychologists, they're not pediatricians, they're not child development specialists. They are merely just ordinary people and often just people with minimum education that they have to have. And mm -hmm. so they're coming into this process <clears throat> taking children. And unfortunately, a lot of that has now occurred because of the funding, because they're getting tax-free money to raise these children. And so, you know, and then once they adopt, now there is some follow-up with the Kate, with the state agency um, until the adoption occurs. And then once the adoption occurs, the state agency doesn't even go back and look. Okay. There's no follow-up at all. Once the states, uh, once the adoption has been complete. And I know of cases, oh gosh, you know, there are a few cases that are just so frightening where an adoptive child, I mean, we had a case in Tennessee where two kids had been adopted through the system, were buried in the backyard. And, you know, it's likely that those adoptive parents were still collecting the money that they were getting off of those children and hadn't even reported them dead. I mean, if you're burying a child in the back right, backyard, you're going to an extreme uh, you know, situation to be able to hide something. And so, and then we had one, you know, I had a case and I was kind of tangent, tangentially involved in it, not directly involved, but these two little girls were adopted out to a preacher and his wife. And then after the adoption was final, final the little one little girl finally admitted that the father preacher had been sexually assaulting her for two years so there's no follow-up and the the potential for damage is outrageous so you know and and i'll just say you know that that they do not want to even children who are abused in foster care the state agency will leave a child who's abused in foster care for something that they would remove from the parents, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I have a good example of that. I worked with a family, there were three, four little bitty children removed, all under, all preschool children, one of them was a baby. <clears throat> but they put these children with a, all with the same foster family, and one was a tiny baby, so that wasn't much trouble. There were two little girls and a little boy, and the little boy was the one who was kind of the middle child, about three or four years, three, I think. And he was so traumatized by the move. He was acting out incredibly. And the way they handled it is they put him in the closet and they would leave him in the closet. And finally, the oldest of the children, the one who was five going on six years old, she disclosed this multiple times to people that her little brother was being put in the closet by the foster parents and they did nothing. And sometimes I don't find any of these things out until way after the fact, because they hide it all. I mean, they hide it from the foster care review board meetings. They hide it from the what's called the family permanency meetings. They even hide it from the guardian ad litem sometime because they cannot have that black mark on the foster home and they need more foster homes and they don't want foster parents to get sued, right? Because if we sue them and they start having some liability, then there's going to be less people who want to be foster parents. And the foster parent private company business model is a cash cow. It is a cash cow. And, mm -hmm. you know, from somebody who's been in business before and been in the restaurant business, where you have to have a facility and equipment and insurance. I mean, just think about the foster parent model. You don't even have to, you don't even have an expense until you have income, right? You don't pay a foster parent before they have a child. You just pay, a, you know, them once they have a child. Now I say that out loud. And one of my greatest fears is that they change this program so that people who are willing to be foster parents, but are not yet fostering will still get paid something every month. I just know that's coming. And mm -hmm. it's so frightening because they're out there. They're saying, we can't get enough foster parents. We can't get enough foster parents. We can't get enough foster parents. They're going to somehow manipulate this system and get more money and more cash flow in it and say, hey, if you just sign up to be a foster parent, we'll pay you four, five, six hundred dollars a month tax free, just so your home is available to foster. I'm just I'm so frightened about that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sitting on the edge of my seat, just like waiting for that to happen so I can scream out loud. But I know this system so well, and I've seen their patterns so much that I could just like almost predict the things that I see that are about to unfold. <laughs> oh. oh, I'm sure. I, 
you have seen it all. <laughs> well, you know, <sighs> I think I've seen it all. And then every time I think I've seen it all, I see something new or, you know, some new version of it. I know there's a, a father out of uh, Alaska who had just shared with me a video where he is talking to the social worker and here he's in Alaska and he's working on parent reunification and he's working on relative placement. And he gets a call from the social worker who says, your children are going to be going to Florida for a month. And then the foster parents are moving to Missouri. Oh. And they're like, and then they're like, well, you'll still have visitation. I'm like, what? Oh. <laughs> what? And I'm sure they won't even like, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe if they transfer the case to Missouri and he could move there if he had to, but no, they'll keep the case in Alaska. Mm -hmm. So he still has to go to court in Alaska and make him travel. What, how, what, a thousand miles for a two hour visit with his children in the state of Missouri. And, you know, Missouri is the state that just lost a thousand children this past year. And so it's so frightening. I mean, we know foster care is a failure. All the stats are out there. It's a social engineering program that has not worked. You know, we it needs to be shut down. We need to have serious discussions about alternatives. And what do those alternatives look like for children who need safety? You know, only about 15% of the children that end up in foster care are there because of physical or sexual abuse. It's mostly under this broad category of neglect. And mm -hmm. half of those children that are there under neglect are there under some type of substance abuse. And that substance abuse to a, a child welfare agency can be anything from smoking marijuana on the weekends to hardcore everyday meth use. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no discernment there. There's no assessment as to can we do something and keep the children safe at home? Because a child would rather be at home, even in an imperfect home, than mm -hmm. be in the home of a stranger. There is so much psychological damage that is happening to these children. I mean, they're more likely as adults to be in prison. They're more likely to have their own children removed. They're less likely to even finish high school, much less ever go to college. And it just goes on and on and on. I mean, every bad outcome of adulthood has been measured for children who have been through the foster system. And it's bad. I mean, every single homelessness, you know, half of the people who are homeless who've been in the foster care system. So every outcome is, is substantially more bad than good. And not to say that there are some kids who make it, but, you know, you have to think even under the best circumstance, if a child is, gets in a foster home where they have some loving parents, and I do have, I know some people like that. I know some people who have taken on foster children, adopted them, done outstanding, amazing jobs for them. And even there, you know that there's got to be some struggle with that child as far as just attachment issues and stability mm -hmm. issues and just, just that psychological development that you go through in your 20s and 30s, just to be a, a more secure adult, right? Mm -hmm. Because everything about your childhood has been a reflection of insecurity. And I do speak that with some personal knowledge because I did adopt my children from Russia when they were five and they're now 30. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have, even in their young adult years, even though we, you know, I did everything I could to exude, uh, you know, stability and, and security and stuff all during that time. And, and, you know, that they knew what to expect on a day-to-day -day basis, but even into their twenties, you know, they begin to, sh I began to see where some of those insecurities have come out. Mm -hmm. So you just, you can't, you know, children in their first 10 years, they need safety and security. They mm -hmm. need to know what they can expect, who they can trust, who they can't trust, what places are safe, uh, that the, the adults around them are going to keep them safe. I mean, they, they need to know those things. And when we disrupt that within that first decade of their life, we are just, I mean, it's a lifetime of trying to to uh, overcome that and make that better. That's so sad. I mean, <laughs> talk about destroying lives. It doesn't stop because it seems when I when I talk to people that have been in foster care, when they go to have kids of their own, then they're being harassed by CPS and their kids get taken away and into foster care. 
Yeah. And, you know, on Facebook, there are a couple groups that uh, are foster, aged out foster children and they're private groups. And a couple of groups have let me in their group. And, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't make very many comments, but I watch some of the struggles that they go through. And there are so many of those who will say, you know, I've continued to struggle or, you know, I just can't make attachments as an adult. I mean, they, they are now verbalizing it and being vocal. And that's been one of my prayers too over the past, you know, eight to nine years has been that these people who are suffering will vocalize it because you can't, you can't get a cure and you can't get redirection until you really feel the problem, right? You have to just feel it. You can't just read it or you can't just, you can't try to cognitively um, and logically dissect it. <clears throat> you can't just say, you know, we're building, you know, and, and if I put it in some other terms, I, I don't know, I mean, something totally unrelated, but like a product liability case, let's say there's faulty seat belts, right? And, and, and then you have 12 accidents and somebody gets, somebody dies, right? Because of mm -hmm. a faulty seat belt. I mean, it's not the engineer who comes in and says, well, you know, uh, I was a little curious about that seatbelt when I built it, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's the people who step up and say, you know, there was a faulty mm -hmm. seatbelt seat and I lost my husband. I lost my daughter. I, you know, so, so the impact on our lives is such an important and critical part of change. And it's so sad. It's so sad. And gosh, I could get into a real tangent. <laughs> I mean, I've worked with so many hundreds of families in the past 30 years through the family court system. I could get into a real tangent with ADHD medicine, vaccines, oh, yeah. you know, at this strong allergy medicine and things like that, that they put children on that have really been just like, so broken my heart, all the psychotropic medication, ugh, the manipulation of children. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, and, and the more we hear from that, and we've got to hear from that. And I just, that's, you know, I want people to tell that story and mm -hmm. reach out. I even found one, uh, I do some TikTok videos, we have a few people speaking out on TikTok, people should also look into that just to kind of see some of that personal impact mm -hmm. of what is happening. And, you know, there was a video on there of a young girl who was probably 15, 16 years old, and she did this TikTok video and she was weeping and she said, I do not want to be adopted by the people that I'm living with. I mean, she was crying. She was sobbing. She was, you know, her breath was very weak and uh, and it was heartbreaking because, you know, I'm sure mm -hmm. the people that are in the court system don't even know her feelings about that. <clears throat> so many of these children are reduced to file folders and numbers and dollars and cents and, you know, months in care. And, oh, we've got to stabilize this child. You know, we're going to finalize this adoption instead of trying to think of how they can restore that family. I saw that TikTok as well. Mm -hmm. um, do you think also the if the judge even talks to this child, they're probably not even listening. Listening, They just want to sign the paperwork and get the money flowing. Well, and you know, and I've been in the court system a long time and I have been in front of a lot of different judges because of Tennessee's 95 counties. I probably was in at least a third of them, if not half of them. So I've been in all kinds of rural counties, metropolitan counties, working in the juvenile court judges, the circuit judges, I've done appeals. I mean, a judge to a child is a very intimidating process. It's a very frightening process. And, you know, and I have these judge and a lot of them are men, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I've, I've had cases and, you know, and I, I have tried to make comments to these judges. I had one judge, an older judge here in particular in Williamson County, and, you know, he'd say like, well, we'll go in the, we'll go back in the conference room. So it's not so intimidating. And, you know, they'll go in the conference room and what they still sitting at the head of the table. They still have a black robe on. They have these attorneys and court reporters all sitting around them. I mean, it's like, it's like putting you on, on, on Mars or something. I mean, it's such an out of, out of character experience for a child. And mm -hmm. so, and we don't, you know, children do not know how to react under that situation. And I've had every kind of response. I've had children who totally clam up. I have children who are so uh, nervous that the comments that they make to the judge are comical. 
right? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes that's a stress relief for a child, um, <clears throat> which, which unfortunately immediately triggers to a judge a discrediting of their testimony, right? Because they think the child is, you know, just trying to be funny. And you're mm -hmm. right, the child is trying to be funny because not because the child is trying to lie to you or make a joke of it because the child is nervous and they're trying to reduce the trauma from that experience. Mm. So I've had children kind of make a joke about it. I've had children just totally clam up. I've had children, you know, uh, be totally afraid to tell the truth. And you can tell in their, in their narrative and what they do say. So, you know, trying to get a child in a situation where they're comfortable uh, and then, you know, the court appoints a guardian ad litem who's supposed to protect the child's, represent the child's best yeah. interest, and they don't represent the child, they represent the child's best interest. A child doesn't understand that. And you have these guardian ad litems who go in and say, well, I'm your attorney. I'm like, no, you're not. Don't, you know, don't lie. You're mm -hmm. not his attorney. You're the child's best interest attorney. And if that child says he wants to go home and you don't come to court immediately and say this child wants to go home, you need to make sure that the court knows that and the child has appropriate representation. It is such a, it's horrible. And I've even had to go to court and say, your honor, this attorney, this guardian ad litem is not being truthful about what this child wants and is not advocating for the child. You need to step in and of course, they don't like me for saying that because I'm mm -hmm. the only person who steps up and says that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this whole this whole thought of having a family advocate that's an independent process that's who doesn't get caught up in the adversarial part of it, but is there to say, OK, here's what I see. Here's some things that we need to do to try to manage this system. And, um, you know, we've there's been in California, I will say, <laughs> Of course, you know, the state of California, whatever they do, it has to be a million dollar business, right? I mean, <laughs> they, whatever they create, they have to make into a million dollar business. So California did, has implemented what they call, uh, what is it, parent coordinators and parent family cust or custody evaluations, right? And mm -hmm. of course, they've generated a, a billion dollar business out of this because these parents go to court and the judge goes, okay, I'm going to order you to have a custody evaluation, forces them to go to a licensed psychologist, and then the licensed psychologist is charging them between thirteen and $20,000 mm -hmm. per parent just to do that. And then, of course, that's a pot shot. The parent has no idea what's going to come out of that custody evaluation. And it's really intended to influence the judge. And so a parent advocate is not there to really to influence the judge. They're really there to empower the people who are participating in the process so they have a better understanding and they're better prepared. Mm -hmm. OK, and, you know, I'm just going to say as Americans, we don't do a very good job. I mean, we mm -hmm. barely understand banking. Right. And we all have a checking account and a savings account. But we don't even really understand that process. We don't understand, you know, the service fees and the credit card fees. And, and we just kind of walk around oblivious to that. However, if you were thinking about going to Disney World, I bet you'd get online, you'd research it, you'd see how much the tickets are, you'd see how long the lines were to stand in line. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we're so totally distracted by things that entertain us that we have forgotten that we are living in a system that we need to understand. So, you know, we have advocates now in we have mental health advocates, disability advocates, we have education advocates, uh, we have social security advocates, we have military advocates, and these are people who just have that higher level of training that they can operate as an independent support system within this uh, system. Um. Yeah, that's what we need. Um, family court also has to be abolished. That's another travesty. Well, you know, I just read, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I didn't know if we'd have time to talk about this or not, but well, we do. <laughs> So um, I'm always, everybody sends me a ton of stuff through Messenger and Lakes. And so on the NIH, which is the National Institute of Health, uh, they recently published a study from Spain. Now, so just so mm -hmm. you know, the problems with domestic violence and family courts travel across the, across the uh, ocean. This is a study from Spain where they studied, um, we, I call it litigation abuse. They call it legal abuse and harassment. And they looked at four areas. 
So they looked at direct aggression, procedural harassment, personal contempt, and manipulation of reality. And they were able, and you know, they talk about in here how hard it was to even do this study because you really can't even get access to the people who are, are in that place, right? I mean, there's not really a good way to find out who's in that. Now, there are creative ways that you could do it through the AOC and the court system, and we really need to take a deeper look at that. But they did uh, surveys that they uh, got uh, uh, family law attorneys to actually get some people to participate in. Now, I think they only had about 100 participants, which we know is very, very low, because mm -hmm. in Tennessee alone, out of, I think we have... 60, you know, when I checked, it's been a few years ago, we had like 68,000 marriages and about 35,000 divorces every year. So, oh, you know, we know there are the people in the system amount to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So we really need to get a better way to do an exit poll, basically, right? Like an exit interview. Like, how did this process work for you? Is there ways that we could make it mm -hmm. better? You know, just like people do in business, right? Mm -hmm. When you get off the airplane, you know, they send you a, when you get off the phone with Comcast, you know, they're like, are you willing to take a survey about mm -hmm. how well we did, right? And yet people don't have any feedback. And of course they don't want it, but they did a questionnaire and they ask people um, like, for instance, let me get to the questionnaire part of it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there were questions that they went through and they scaled things on one through five and they ask, uh, which I, of course, the domestic violence part of it are things like getting threats uh, outside of the courtroom or getting uh, intimidation and stuff outside of the courtroom, jokes, communication that's abrasive and abusive. But, you know, I, I really started then focusing in on the things that happen as part of the court process. And here's here are some of the questions they asked, which I think are very telling. And I totally understand because I've been in the courtroom with those victims like mm -hmm. the judge or the lawyers no longer address me directly. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're talking about how they go into the courtroom and they actually become a non person. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I hate the I hate the fact that we call people in the courtroom parties. I'm like, there's yeah. no party here. <laughs> this right. is not a party. <laughs> this yeah. is litigation, <laughs> you know, and we need to say the litigants, if we're going to use any type of collective term, you know, mm -hmm. but the husband, the wife, the mother, the father, but they stop talking to the people directly. The other secondary harm to this is 80% of the attorneys don't know the facts of their case when they walk into the courtroom. And so a judge may say to the attorney, well, uh, did your client, did your client take the child to the doctor last week? You know, and honestly, the attorneys just like st look, stand there looking mm -hmm. wide open and look to their client. I mean, now I'm the kind of attorney who would say, Your Honor, I really need my client to address that question. I think, you know, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to be a surrogate for that comment mm -hmm. or we can put her on the stand. But that is so true. It happens all the time that they stop talking to the people directly. Uh, here's a great one, which is I am legally ignored and my version of the facts are ignored. Mm -hmm. And that is so true because there are always one more than one version of the facts and people get talked over. They get cut off. The attorneys get cut off. Um, there's just no way that there's, a, it's not, it's supposed to be a fair and impartial tribunal. I mean, the judge's real job is to listen to both part, both sides of the case, both set of facts, and then to say, well, here's the facts that I am, am looking at that I think are the most significant and that, that make the most sense into what's occurred and then make legal decisions based upon that. Mm -hmm. Here's another big one. They do not give me the chance to speak. <laughs> yep. Oh. How many people have said that? Like they they just don't even get a talk at all. I mean, I've had people call me all the time about their cases, especially their child welfare cases. And I say, did you testify? And they're like, I've never spoken a word in court. Here they've been in court a year or two years, and maybe they've never even spoken a word. Hey, Here's Connie. another Mm -hmm. I was on a Zoom about two weeks ago, and this Zoom was in Miami, Dade, Florida, and the mother was a pro se litigant, and she was going through her case, and she was doing fine, and then the judge just put her on mute several times. I would say at least twice that I saw, because you know I, I think when he knew what she was talking about, just doesn't want to hear it, just rudely. 
Well, you know, yeah. So I was in a courtroom back in March and I was talking about public records and they were trying to intimidate me from getting these public records. And they started asking me some questions that I started answering. And the other side did not like my answers, but couldn't really object to him. And the, the other attorney said, uh, Your Honor, I make a motion that we put her testimony under seal. So that's how they handle it if you're in the courtroom. So even though it's a public courtroom and they don't want your voice to be public. So here's another one. It says, when I make any legal applications to the court, they normally refuse my request or hinder me with drawbacks. And so, you know, this is part, there's so many procedural manipulations that happen in the courtroom that the judges are in control of. And, you know, you may go to court all prepared as an attorney, and the other side calls in at the last minute or somebody's sick at the last minute or the other uh, attorney comes in at the last minute and says, you know, Your Honor, I'm just not really prepared today because I had a hearing. You know, I just came out of three days of hearing and I just wouldn't be fair to my client for us to proceed today. So I need to set this off another two weeks. And they let it happen without mm -hmm. any warning to you. You know, and the, the costs that are incurred with that, because when my clients, when I was representing them, I'm like, look. If I step in a courtroom, you can be pretty much guaranteed it's going to cost you $1,500 because I have to book out the day, at least half a day, even if I can get back and do some things in the afternoon, you have to pay for my time. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so that's one of the ways that they starve people out of litigation is to make them pay these huge expenses when things get delayed and things get continued and you don't even find out about it. Or I've prepared three hours for the hearing and then it gets kicked down the road two months. Well, do you think two months from now, I'm going to remember everything that I prepared oh, the last time I thought I was going to court? And it's not that I have to start over because I probably already created evidence files, et cetera. But I have to sit down and spend at least another hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours just going through, making sure I know what my points are that I want to make. Mm. Here's one. The judge and or prosecution interrupt me when I am speaking and do not let me finish what I want to say. Amen. Amen. Yep. That's all I can say about that. And objections, the other side objects just to interrupt somebody and just to distract their line of questioning. How many times have I had a client on the stand and the other side objects and the judge, you know, overrules their objection. And then the client just kind of looks at me like, I forget where I was. Right. Uh -huh. Of course they do. I mean, how many of us, when we're interrupted, just in a simple phone conversation with a friend, something happens or somebody interrupts you and then you're like, where was I? <laughs> and then you sound like an idiot, right? In the courtroom. Um, uh, here's, a, here's a great one. Negative confidential reports are issued about me without being notified or given the opportunity to defend myself. I've seen that happen as well. The court orders a psyche vow and then they refuse to give a copy to the person that they did a psyche vow with. I'm like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. An attorney mm -hmm. cannot even prepare for defense or the judge puts an order down that the attorney can get a copy of the psyche vow, but can't give a copy to their client. They can, they can sit down and look at it with their client, but they can't give a copy to their client. Now, a couple problems. First of all, if you're going to do a thorough examination of it, you're going to have to book out a half a day, three or four hours to sit down and go with your client page by page of a 20 or 30 page report. Then you're going to have to plan for some type of cross-examination. So it's an incredible cost to the people that's totally unnecessary. When the client can review it themselves and then they can make some notes or they can bring up some issues by the time they meet with their attorney. And then uh, here's another one is they try to barrage me, put me under pressure by asking a barrage of questions, right? So mm -hmm. those are the kinds of things that they did in this interview. And they found, you know, this high prevalence of people of secondary uh, victimization, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. when you're going through a difficult time and, and it can be domestic violence, but or it can be child removal, it can be a welfare case. But really just being in that court system and that court process is a re-victimization of somebody who even needs to be there in the first place. I mean, maybe you're not even the one who filed for a divorce or who filed for the custody case. Maybe you're the one, you know, a lot of times if you have a case that's a paternity case and the people are just now, you know, looking at custody issues, maybe you're a mama who's been raising a 
a baby for a year and just trying to get a job and be stable. And then, you know, the daddy takes you to court fighting you for custody of your child. And all you've been trying to do is be a good mama. And now you have to have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars to hire an attorney. It's such a ridiculous state of affairs that's that's stealing and robbing from family resources that mm -hmm. is totally unnecessary. No, oh, I agree. And it's <clears throat> happening way too often where I'm also seeing, I don't know if you're noticing this as well, but uh, these wealthy men marry younger women that mm -hmm. are accomplished, like say attorneys or doctors, and they call them their retirement plans. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And then what they'll do is they'll have a couple babies with them. Mm -hmm. And then they'll divorce them and take them to court and have them pay child support. Right, right. They'll go for custody because they'll say, well, I'm retired. You know, I'm the stay at home daddy here. You know, I'm the one who can take care of the children. Right. And then also, you know, hatch into or get into their, uh, you know, half of their retirement account that they've earned during the marriage. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I've seen that. That is woo, that is like. That's like a narcissist off the charts. <laughs> yes. So, I'm like, if you don't have a prenup, you know, going into a situation like that and from both sides, you know, but if you, because if it like, for instance, in Tennessee, in Tennessee, it's an equitable property state. And so what equitable property means is like, if you have premarital assets, they're your assets, mm -hmm. unless you intentionally commingle them, which is different from a common law, not a common law, but a, a community property state like Texas and California. So Texas and California are community property states. And that means the day you get married, everything's we, air all the properties, we, whatever you have. But in Tennessee and, mo and at least half of the other states, <clears throat> it's called an equitable property. So that means your property coming into it is yours unless you commingle it. And so, however, what you earn during the marriage is automatically joint unless you have a prenup. So if somebody who is retiring and already has their retirement account kind of set aside, Marry somebody who's 15, 16 years younger and or 20 years younger who's still working and, you know, has a couple babies. And honestly, that that professional woman is probably glad to have that help in the household to raise her babies. Mm -hmm. But she's still working and she starts making six figures and she starts contributing to a, a retirement plan. Then when they get a divorce, she's going to have to give him half of her retirement but he doesn't have to give her half of his retirement. And so you're right. Then he can fight for custody and then he can have her pay child support on top of that as well. Mm -hmm. It's almost like marry at your own risk. Uh, yeah, for sure. Well, if you don't have a prenup going into a marriage these days, because we know that it's, there's a more than 50% failure rate and more than 50% divorce rate, you know, it's just not, it's kind of like I just talked about, about a bank, right? You go to open a bank account. You don't study all the 16 different types of bank accounts that they have before you go in there. You just go in there like, I need a checking account and a savings account, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but if you go to Disneyland, you're going to research all day. You're going to see what are the best days to go? When is the crowd the highest? When's it going to, what's the temperature going to be? How do I get in one of those little wristbands where I can cut through the line, you know, or a cruise, right? You go mm -hmm. on a cruise, you like find what's the best cruise what's the best port to go out of how many stops are we going to make what are my excursions going? right but you get married and you go down and you pay fifty dollars to the clerk and you can get a, a officer of the you know a peace officer to to give you to marry you and you haven't done any research you don't know mm -hmm. i mean it's just crazy you're not prepared at all and people who are not prepared going into that serious of a partnership and financial relationship, it's just insane. And I did, you know, quite a few premarital plannings and premarital strategies, uh, you know, while I was practicing law and, and, you know, and lawyers don't really, they really don't like to do it that much because it's kind of like, I'll make more money off your divorce and I'll make off your premarital planning. <laughs> so you know, they, they're not, you know, premarital, really premarital counseling and planning from a legal and financial standpoint is not big business for lawyers mm -hmm. because it's just, you know, they make more money off of divorces and they can keep a divorce couple in court for five years easy. Yeah. Sad state of affairs for sure. Yes. 
<laughs> yes, it is. It is. So where are you at now? So uh, we are, um, I've had several deadlines. They've created all this chaos. I've had several deadlines on briefing I've had to do. And I'm actually a good writer and a good legal researcher. So I've had my little touche planted in a chair in front of a desk for a significant amount of time. Mm. Uh, the only thing is I'm also a really good litigator and a really good sort of people integrator person. And I'm, you know, I don't have that opportunity to do that. And, you know, when they, once I kind of get through this and they, you know, we unleash the Kraken, so to speak, you know, it's going to be, uh, I'm going to have a field day in, in taking both of those skills and talents and merging them into something that I can do that's so dynamic that it's just going to be like people are they just can't keep up I mean they you know they stalk me on Facebook because that was my primary platform while I was a practicing attorney because it was easy I could get a group but you know when I have 12 platforms going at one time it's going to be hard for them to keep up with it uh -huh. so I'm really looking forward it's been a terrible year for me there is no doubt I mean they've done everything they can to silence me discredit me bankrupt me whatever they just they have tried however it's uh, and it's been a real cat and mouse game. I mean, it's like when I turn left, they turn right. And then they try to cut me off at the pass. Uh, but I'm continuing to just persevere and push through and going to continue to do so. And once we're through there, we will then start to expose what they're really doing at this point. And hopefully that will make an impact for a lot of people and especially attorneys who are mm -hmm. now afraid to do anything because of what they've done to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just sitting on my haunches. I'm doing the work I need to do. God has said, be at peace. You know, there are, you know, there's a time, you know, there's a season for everything. And that's just kind of a season to kind of move through this with a steady pace. And that's really what I've done for the past few months. So I'm prepping up for 2023 in a variety of ways. And, you know, I just put that message out there to your listeners that public activism is so important. And if you don't have the passion for child welfare and family court reform like I do, I'm sure there is something you have a passion for and you need to grab that passion and you need to find some leaders in that specific area and move forward with them. Mine is the familyforwardfoundation.com, which is uh, which there's a website for. You can put it, plug in an email address there as well as it does have a donation a tab as well. And then we are um, Family Forward Project on Facebook. Uh, I do have a Family Forward uh, Foundation page. I also have a Connie Regulie Family Advocacy page that people can follow. They can just look up my name on uh, YouTube, on TikTok, on Instagram. I just go under my name, so I'm very easy to follow. Truth Social. I mean, it's just I'm just plugging in things wherever I can at this point. So it's going to be a dynamic, I think, a dynamic year coming up, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to make a lot of people nervous. So we need to keep, uh, we need to stick together, and we need to keep those voices going out there. And I appreciate so much what you do because you really have developed an audience, and um, you've you're, you've done such an awesome job. So thank you so much, Mary. Well, I appreciate your kind words, and mm -hmm. I thank you for everything you've done. And I definitely want you to come back on and update us on. 2023. <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh, for sure. And we probably need to, you know, get together, you know, in early 2023, because I'm sure I'll have some plans in place by then. Awesome. Well, hey, don't jump off. Slam the Galves, a podcast to help the public understand what really goes on in these family courtrooms. I am your host, Marianne Petrie, author of Dismantling Family Court Corruption, Why Taking the Kids Was Not Enough, and Cry Out for Justice, Poems of Truth. Please join us here again in the future with Connie regularly and other exciting guests. Thank you so much, Connie. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.